Welcome to X Talks again. I'm Jesse. Today we invite Andy Johnson to talk about a very interesting topic: SAPI's potential in games gamification and augmented reality. I think most people love playing games. Many games have been designed purposefully to facilitate learning, as go game-based learning, and also game elements and mechanism. Have been put into something that's not a game to enhance some desired behaviors. It's called gamification. Um, Andy Johnson has been working in e-learning for over ten years and served as technical lead on a variety of projects. His specialties include GORM, SAPI, implementation of technology, game design. And system architecture. Recent years, most of his time was spent as part of ADO initiative and coordinating SAPI standard spec writing with the community. Maybe some of you、uh, don't know he has a passion about all kinds of games. Um, Andy, thanks for being with us today. I know you have built the presentation material. Specifically for today's talk. Thank you. Now it's all your time. Oh no problem. Thank you, Jesse, for having me. All right. So I think we are ready to get going.、Uh, as Jesse said, I'm Andy Johnson.、Um, this is my inf information on the front of the slide. So I'd like、mm -hmm. to talk to you today about XAPI's potential in games, gamification, augmented reality, and we'll dabble a little in simulation as well. So I, I wanted to kind of introduce first. Um, the, the difference between all of these different、um, topics, games are, the, and the difference between them is pretty big. If you think about games, games are actually their own medium,、uh, and the way I like to think of it is a, a game is a house. It is an entire thing that you can live in, that you can work with. Many games are actually in virtual worlds, so this、um, this symbolism makes sense.、Uh, within a game, there are different things that you're going to do. For example, there's there's different constructs. First, there's usually a way that you can win or lose in a game. Now, it's not always the case. There are some free form games, but you play. A lot of people play games to win or lose, and they, that's where they find part of the thrill in it. A game will always have, at least a good game, will always have meaningful choices. That means what you do actually matters.、Um, there are some games that don't. So, take example, the card game War, or even some.、Um, Uh, earlier games like、uh, Sorry or Rift,、uh, Sorry is one of them that you basically keep rolling a dice and something keeps happening,、uh, you, and you really don't have any choices. Even、uh, some games like Monopoly,、um, if you took out the house buying, there aren't really no meaningful choices because the strategy is to buy everything. So some games kind of either have no choices because you're just doing the same action over and over, or can、um, lose meaningful choice by, by having a very easy、uh, optimal strategy for winning. Uh, games offer feedback, and this is one of the things that distinguishes them the most from uh, other uh, mediums. In that,、mm -hmm. it gives feedback, and it's often exaggerated and immediate. So, a game won't let you、uh, won't usually string you along. So, let's say you are playing a game, and you talk to a character, and you character, and you make a bad decision、uh, in dialogue. For example, you tell that character that you didn't like them. Well, let's say then you play that game for another 20 hours. And that character, by the end of the story, says, "Oh, by the way, when you said you didn't like me at the beginning of the game, that's going to ruin your game, you know." And that character does something to you, which causes you to lose or, you know, have a bad、uh, experience. That that doesn't that isn't useful.、Um, the feedback needs to be immediate and oftentimes exaggerated, so that you, we can see the clear cues of what's happened. Mm -hmm. A game will often have surprise and discovery. Both of these elements are important、um, for making a game fun.、Um, if you know if it's essentially entirely predictable, that isn't going to be fun. And if there's really nothing to discover, you know that also isn't fun. You want to explore a world and uncover new things.、Uh, a game will often have a storyline or a plot.、It、doesn't have to. Many games don't. But、uh, the narrative of the games is important. And sometimes the, the narrative doesn't even take on The form of a story or a plot. The narrative、um, can be something simple. So, for example, if you, anybody's played Dr. Mario on Nintendo,、uh, 
um, the you know you can make your own narrative of it of you and, and the UI supports this of there's a sick patient and you're trying to make them better by coordinating um, matching um, medicine to viruses to, to kill the viruses. Um, you know, even though there's nothing said, there's an implied storyline and plot which uh, adds to uh, uh, how you feel about playing the game and gives you a more sense of being close to it. A game is oftentimes, and you know, again, a good game will, rely on skill or ability. Uh, mm -hmm. if there are, it's possible to be good at a game or bad at a game. Uh, otherwise, you're, if you're just walking through an experience, that's not a game. If you're ability doesn't impact it. Again, that goes back to meaningful choices. So those two things playing off each other are are important for engagement because let's face it, we want to do things that we're good at. And then within games, there's learning inside. This, the way we learn is we learn inside the construct of a game. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more on the difference. But basically, we learn inside the game. Now, there's different qualities of games. Uh, just like there's different qualities of houses. This is a really bad house, really bad game. So an example of this um, that I like to use is uh, Friday the 13th for Nintendo. And pretty much most movies that were made into games are bad games um, because they miss out on some of those uh, different things that we just talked about or they are um, too hard or too easy or sim you know, simply aren't um, giving the user what they're looking for. Friday the 13th, for example, was extremely confusing. Um, the choices weren't meaningful uh, because you would essentially get stuck along the same path. And if a game is too hard, there's no such thing as a meaningful choice because you're always losing. Uh, you have Part of meaningful choice means you do actually have to be able to win sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'd take that into a, a different type of game, different quality of health. Uh, World of Warcraft, for example, and I'm not, I don't want to compare these two on size because small games can certainly be very well done, but World mm -hmm. of Warcraft had a way of giving players meaningful choices through a talent system. It had interesting dialogue. It had uh, essentially ways to win and lose. The challenge level was just about right. They did all those things that we talked about. They did very, very well. That's one of why it's the, pretty much the most successful game of all time. Now, I do want to talk about Experience API, too. Um, part of the, the, the integration I see with Experience API uh, is that the three main things. Um, first, that XAPI can show you the path to the meaningful choice. So within a game, there might be some things that happen. Um, for example, let's say, and I hate to kind of, I'm, I'm going to get a little more into a little bit into simulation with this because we're, we want to talk about serious games when we talk about a meaningful choice because I do want this to be applicable. So let's say you are working in a, a power plant or other facility which has a lot of controls and there's a four lever system. Now you'd want, ideally you'd train somebody to do this, but let's say you're looking at somebody's um, logical capability. So let's say there's a four lever system and there are no clues on how to figure out which two levers they need to pull at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you look at, let's say then, um, they start pulling levers. You would want to look at the order they pull those levers in, in order to see if they understand what they're doing. So if, let's, say the, and let's say they had to pull two and four at the same time, and they start out pulling one and two, one and three, one and four, two and three, two and four, and, and, and then, they, then they finally hit it. That shows a good iteration of exploring a, uh, a problem space. Whereas mm -hmm. if they just kind of started pulling two levers at a time, ended up repeating a couple of the choices, you know, mm -hmm. what they're doing is important to know um, because you can then tell if they're engaged, if they're, you know, if that's somebody you want working on that type of those types of problems, et cetera. Um, and, and, and being able to determine that rather than just if they did it right or how long it took them is, is going to be important. Um, the, probably the biggest one of these is Experience API vocab, vocabulary enables any gaming experience. You, with Experience API, the vocabulary is open and expandable so that any type of interaction you want to track can come into the space. It, in SCORM, we had the problem where everything had to be force-fit into a variable. In Experience API, you can 
talk about your own verbs. You can create your own verbs and rely on communities that have done that ahead of time. So within, let's say, designing virtual worlds, you might want to have similar verbs for how somebody moves in a space, interacts with various objects, et cetera. And finally, uh, Experience API can do the game feed portion of the game. So as things are happening, and normally there is feedback to the user of what's going on in their world, um, and I'll, we'll show examples of this a little bit later. Um, uh, uh, sure. Yes, Jesse. I have a real question. Uh, you have talked about um, meaningful choice, and you uh, make a very good example about what's called a meaningful choice. Uh, so if the learner has a strategy to find the uh, final answer, that's what we call meaningful choice. That's one of the examples. And so if we want to visualize this pattern, is it possible? Yeah, it, and there's different ways too. So I think some of the visual ones, I think the example I gave is probably a little oversimplified. So there are some really interesting visual examples as well that Experience API could support uh -huh. in that. Let's say, um, let's say you're doing surgery and you have to make an incision from point A to point B, but it's not a straight line. It, there's some sort of curvature to it. Um, being able to watch that, for example, so within a, in XAPI you can attach um, evidence of learning as a file. So you might want to attach a video. Um, you might want to articulate that through um, movement in space by tracking different points they went to rather than if they just went from A to B. Um, another kind of surgical example would be, let's say you're studying how their hand grasps a tool and how they're performing the incision. You want to capture pressure points, for example. You might want to also capture if their hand is slipping or not or how long it takes them to get the correct grip because you're probably very interested in, in a surgeon who might uh, make mistakes or, you know, fumble their fingers, mm -hmm. but those types of things might not be captured in a simulation um, because you know, they might simply be dragging it, but you might not see different things like their fingers are wrong. Um, there are other different uh, applications as well that have to do with body control that we could capture. So let's say, you know, getting out there, a little more dance interpretation. So let's say uh, if you've got a game that you're supposed to do the right dance moves, uh, you, uh, you'd want to make sure that you capture what else you're doing that's not correct in addition to the correct. If you just have something that's waiting for a state of correctness and then responding to that state, uh, it's important to understand how they got there, especially once you start talking about in, um, in learning, providing feedback to that person on what exactly they're doing wrong. Um, because what they arrive at for a final conclusion might be right, but they might have gotten there the very wrong way. Right, so we can uh, visualize uh, different people's pattern, and then we will find what patterns are good and what patterns are uh, incorrect. That's one way to visualize this. Right, another, another I thought of another good um, problem that kind of gets to how people could approach a situation logically is let's say you were set up with a situation where you had to find a buried, you know, and there's applications for this in logic. Let's say you had to find a buried treasure and you knew it was in a space that was 100 yards big. Mm -hmm. um, and then every time you dug, you would find out if it was to the left or to the right to see how different people would approach solving mm -hmm. that problem. Um, you know, the optimal way, of course, is to go halfway, um, and then from there, even though you're taking more steps, keep having the problem until you find the correct solution. Um, you probably would be less interested in a candidate for a, a job, for example, who just started from one side and just kept going the same, you know, kept going one at a time. I see. So there's, there's lots of different applications for why the, the essentially the journey to that meaningful choice is important. Um, can be captured within games. Yeah, but when we design the uh, analytics, we need we also need to think some backwards. Yes, In definitely. What we want to see and then design backwards on the SAPI statement. Yes. So I uh, kind of got to some of this. The, the meaningful choices of this game are important. So the actions. Um, 
taken to that point. So, in, and I, I don't want this to be lost either. There's, there's sometimes there's micro actions that happen in a game that aren't normally tracked. Um, so let's say there's these meaningful choices, but we do want to know everything that happened before then. Um, you know, maybe they're moving back and forth between two answers, for example, um, in choice in, in dialogue. Maybe um, there are, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a series of um, slight motions they have to take, or even typing, that you'd want to know their mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, also important to, is the amount of time taken. Uh, XAPI is built in with timestamps, so okay. everything that's tracked is also uh, taken into time. This is a, a drastic improvement over SCORM, which is a state-based model that doesn't track time. It just cares about the state you leave things in. Uh, mm -hmm. Experience API lets you to really look at the ordering of things in these, uh, these different transactions. And of course, educators care more about just the choice too. Uh, the choice somebody makes on a test is essentially going to just be a metric of what you can measure. But, you know, we care about our learners. We want to look at um, what prior knowledge they can demonstrate, uh, for example, to pull that type of data in. We want to look at cross-performance, uh, you know, across an entire classroom to improve that content or game itself. And I know we're getting a little bit out of the game realm but and into what Experience API can do. But maybe some part of your learning game is extremely confusing, and that's why people are getting things wrong. Um, or maybe there is a really, really bad choice that you know you yourself haven't done research on, or an aspect of the game prior to that point uh, led someone to believe otherwise. Um, you know, you would want to improve that. And uh, let's. And then the other one is that in moving, let's say moving in space, um, it can suggest uh, bias. So what I mean there. So let's say. Um, Let's say you have uh, an, an example of, you know, I'll, get, I'll go back to games. Let's say there, somebody's talking to you in a virtual game, and there are four choices. And you find out that everybody, or not everybody, there is a larger percentage of people that choose the first option than any of the other options for that particular um, dialogue, and, and let's say that first option is not right. Let's say the correct option is option four, but option one has a staggering to it. And then you look, start looking across um, all the different dialogues, and you realize that every time that answer wrong, one is not correct, there is a, a higher percentage than you would suspect of people that choose it. Um, what you could then look at is, well, is it because it's option one or is it other choices? You could do A-B testing, and maybe you find out things like, oh, well, my UI isn't working right. So sometimes there's a lag, and it causes people to accidentally pick option one even when they don't mean it. And, you know, maybe they don't want to admit that, or maybe that is self-correcting, but, you know, maybe that causes people to have to go to the next question and then come back. Or in the game, they lose and have to either restart or reload. Those types of things can be done to improve um, UI. Although, or in other cases, let's say um, if the, the choices were actually worded but poorly, um, to find biases that might be in there. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about educators, right, they are really the one that, that need to look at those data feedbacks and uh, respond to those feedback loops. But if an educator have 100 students or even more, uh, 1,000 students, the very big classes. Uh, how do you imagine to visualize this uh, process data to him, then he can take response quickly? So one cool visualization I think would be interesting, mm -hmm. especially as you get to larger class sizes, for example, would mm -hmm. be to kind of map out with verbs to see what norm, you know, what the average students are doing. So mm -hmm. and you can kind of get like a stream of the different verbs they've done, and look at, you know, and we're, you know, we're hoping a lot that there's a good amount of average. But I think especially it would be especially interesting to look at the people who are falling outside of what the average uh, learner is doing to see both, you know, who might be exceptional. So maybe there are people who want to solve a problem and have a completely different way of doing it 
that might be better or might show you know certain promise um, to identify those types of students would be good to give them positive feedback um, and to you know potentially even explore uh, solutions that they might have come up with and introduce that as the correct way and of course for those who are not doing the, uh, the uh, in that common stream because they uh, need learning interventions uh, maybe they don't understand maybe they haven't studied um, to figure out you know why they aren't uh, doing things correctly but I think it's it's really interesting when we start getting into these different dynamics of being able to pull in multiple users data and to even show that to them anonymized of course but XAPI really lets you pull in these these large amounts of of data and um, to, to show those different actions in in a, a visualization space I think is really interesting to, uh, to kind of show people hey you're you're doing things just like your classmates um, and, mm -hmm. and, and again being able to extrapolate um, those uh, the outliers mm -hmm. so that also means we need to visualize those data according to competencies um, progresses in a game or in a course so that he can compare the pattern really quick yeah and, I, and competencies are certainly part of it too but even you know even how you approach uh, solving a problem uh -huh. so I mean if you you know let's say you had to do ten different ten very different steps to solve a problem uh, seeing the order that people do them in you know looking at of information on is uh, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Again, getting so I want to talk a little bit more about the vocabulary. So this game is uh, is Maniac Mansion for Nintendo, and uh, they basically this is the the typical environment that you're in here, where you have different verbs that are available to you, but not every interaction and not every world is going to work with just these verbs. Um, you know, this is kind of the same thing we saw in SCORM, where we give people a certain number of fields to use, but it might not quite be enough. So in this, in this environment, it was, the environment had to be designed to get around these 12 verbs. And otherwise, you had some really awkward interactions. Uh, you don't want to confine your learning designers. That's why Experience API has this extensive vocabulary system so that in, especially as you get into very, very specific job roles, some verbs might be very specific to that community of practice um, because that's what they do and they understand the language. And yeah, it might not make sense to people who are outside, but in terms of their day to day getting things done, it's very important. Yeah. And then I wanted to show off some of the, the game logs. So this, these are logs from World of Warcraft. These are already done. This is this is not Experience API, um, and this has the same structure that Experience API has um, because mm -hmm. this is what games have been doing for a long time. So it really makes sense to just start grabbing this data. You've got, you know, your actor is uh, Poneria, and then uh, different things they do. Um, they gain something, they begin, they cast something. Um, you know, this this is very specific to um, just casting magic in the game, but you get the idea that there's different things going on. There's targets, there's... Um, different results that happen in terms of the amount of damage or the amount of something remaining. Mm -hmm. So grabbing these logs that already exist in game and putting into experience API data, getting it out there to do interesting visualizations on is is really neat. And as I said, we, we kind of started dabbling into to serious games, but really the only difference between a serious game is that the uh, what you gain in a serious game is expected to be replicated in the outside world. It still uses gaming constructs. Gaining knowledge skill and, and, and gaining knowledge and skill in that game should still influence your success. But the hope is that this skill will transfer outside. And out, a lot of times, what happens is that when people talk about serious games, they forget the gaming part. Um, which is why a lot of serious games don't end up being very fun. They look more like simulations because they, they lose track of what they're actually trying to do in some of these gaming concepts. Um, but the case is true for all games that the better the content, if you want content to be 
if you want the content to be learned, it has to be a part of the game. And the, so your success in the game has to be due to learning that content. If you just try to make a game and throw content in that's not related, you're, you're not going to be successful in, in getting learning done and, or that type of learning done to benefit somebody either in the game or outside the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next I wanted to get into gamification. And you'll notice we're, we're still in this, uh, the idea of talking about house, but we've got this water slide here. So gamification is like putting a water slide on your content. Now I say content because it, you don't really gamify a game. You gamify other types of content. So as long as we're talking about content as a house, um, it, adding gamification, like adding water slide, can be really fun. It can add some motivation, but it could also be uh, dumb if you put it in the wrong place or if, for example, you don't like water slides. Um, it, it Just because you put gamification on there doesn't mean it's going to be successful. Um, it's possible to do gamification within a game or uh, on top of a game, but one thing you have to understand is that gamification is not the content. Gamification is an accessory to learning content or part or different uh, series of learning contents. So, mm -hmm. some of the things about gamification is it shows real world results. So, it's it's how you did, how you're doing in the real world. Um, those results are all in the real world. So even if it occurred within a game, everything you're doing in gamification is real world results. It's comparing, most likely comparing you to other real people's performances. Mm -hmm. um, there are choices sometimes inside a gamification part, but they don't impact results. So let's say you, your, what you've done in the gamification part will not go back into the content. So because let's say you've earned a badging, so badging is one of these uh, big examples. So let's say you've earned a badge for getting 100% on a math test, it doesn't, and you earn a badge, it doesn't mean you get free points on your next test. That That is not gamification. That that's not good gamification because the gamification part is not supposed to impact what's going on. It's supposed to be motivating for you to do better within the content itself. It's supposed mm -hmm. to be you know, informative and motivating. Mm -hmm. Gamification has very rigid rules and mechanisms. Um, if you don't, it's not going to work. You want to make sure that there are certain ways that you earn things and that those ways are consistent. Again, getting into the badging type of uh, scenario, if you earn a badge and somebody if for a lot of hard work and somebody else has handed that badge for free, you failed because there are different um, social aspects at play that you don't want to mess with. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that in gamification, the learning is everywhere um, and it all impacts within this gamification layer. Gamification layer is a layer that listens and shows information. And the skill also does not impact this layer. Uh, again, it, the skill is meant to be within the content itself, whether it's gaming or not. Uh, being good at the gamification part should not earn you any extras. Uh, it should, again, and especially not going back, it should not go back into the content itself. It should be purely a reporting and motivation mechanism. So again, as I said, the example of, uh, are these digital badges. And unfortunately, a lot of people misuse badges in, this, in the way that I talked about, where they kind of just give them out, and they're not very rigid on the requirements. But badges are, you know, are founded essentially in two places. Uh, first is Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, both of them. Um, and they're very, in, in that's uh, very specific how you earn it. You also saw the concept of badging come into games. And gamers are probably even more hardcore than Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts in that if you earn a badge, um, there are, we, gamers recognize there are some badges that are easy to learn, and they're not that interested in those. They might, it might help get them into being interested in, in badges, but what gamers really go after are those hard to get badges. And there's, it's always important to have those that are tough to reach. But the one thing you can't do is if it's hard to reach, you can't change the criteria for getting that badge because badges, and this is probably the most important part of badges, is they're show, they show respect for the area you've been in. They show accomplishments, and people respect what they, the badge is based on the accomplishments, not on the fact that it looks cute or is, uh, you know, is visually appealing. 
they care about the effort. So if you have a badge from doing something outstanding, so for example, you know, to go beyond um, Boy Scouts, when a, a soldier receives a Purple Heart, you know, that means something very specific. It means you're wounded in combat. That's a, a pretty big deal. Um, you can't just give those out. Gamers, you know, same thing. If you're giving out, uh, if there's a very, very tough challenge that a gamer meets, um, they're interested in that badge. Um, but if you were to just try to sell that badge to somebody, you know, that's a way to destroy the, the social respect surrounding badges. Um, Andy, I have a question about the, sure. uh, you said that you should not let the gamification layer to impact real world or impact the content. But if there's no real result in real world, um, the, but maybe it's not so motivating. Uh, may, for example, if they get promoted or they can do something because of they have get a badge. Is that against your rule? Well, right, and I guess in those scenarios, I'd say it's not a you're not that's not a badge. That's more of incentive, you know, competency based incentives. And I guess that's a good point to make is that I, I when we talk about badges, you don't want to get it too tied down to competencies. Um, while competencies can help you earn badges, that's mm -hmm. not the, the point of badges is still for social respect. Um, you know, if it's a promotion, for example, you might promote somebody um, because they've accomplished a lot, but you wouldn't promote somebody because they have badges. Mm -hmm. and, and again, and, and to kind of reiterate the point, you're, you shouldn't gain a within a system because you have badges, you should gain because of the accomplishment itself. So, you know, because you got 100 on your math test and you get a badge doesn't mean you should get free credit on the next test, or it doesn't mean that within a game environment, for example, because you have this badge, you now earn more points, for example. So um, those types of things are dangerous. Now, if you wanted to make it as a mechanic of the game itself, that's fine, but to to don't then make sure you're not calling it gamification because at that point you've actually gone back into changing the, the game mechanics itself. Um, part of the reason that you don't want to do this is because people who are behind or late enters um, will get extremely frustrated with the gamification layer itself if they realize that either people who have been in it longer or had early success are, are benefiting greatly even in the uh, environment they are introduced in. Mm -hmm. I see. So to uh, to get gamification in XAPI, some of the benefits is, are that you can broadcast anonymous data uh, in real time. So you, gamification layers can grab all of this data, all the data that's been sent to learning record stores. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't have to wait for everything to happen. They don't have to, um, yeah, they don't really have to wait for anything to happen. And you don't have to dig deep into these proprietary databases to get all these individual records. And this is more of just a knock on SCORM because SCORM was set up to be a single learner, single system model. It makes it very hard to pull in multiple results and therefore to create a gamification layer because the whole point of a, a gamification layer is to uh, compare against others. Uh, I might, you know, it might be slightly useful to say that I have a score and I earn points, for example, but it's much more, more motivating if I can compare to my friends or if, um, or even just to see how I'm doing. Like, let's say I can't make direct comparison to my friend Joe um, to see how I'm doing in relation to everybody else. Uh, gamification is really easy to bolt on to any existing content with uh, mm -hmm. using results and result, excuse me, mm -hmm. result extensions. Um, you just basically have to add some fields. And in gamification, a lot of times statements act as evidence. So when we talk about what do you have to do to earn a badge, well, you would actually need a specific statement that came from a specific source. So um, let's say, you know, Jesse can tell anybody who's um, learned a uh, an introduction to games badge. Um, she's a professor of that class. She can, you know, issue a statement that said, this person earned this, um, after these things have happened. So you'd expect to see in that learner's log um, all of the, you know, all of this 
all the events leading up to the evidence, and then finally one statement that acts as that authoritative evidence. Um, so that all those things make gamification um, very possible in XAPI. Mm -hmm. But one thing I have to say about gamification is you don't want to get carried away. Um, you start putting a bunch of stuff on your your content, and all of a sudden it becomes less about the content and more about the gamification. Um, that's the last thing you want. You still want to remain focused on the content, um, motivated to learn the content, because if the gamification layer takes over, users will be flying through the content to get to the gamification layer, and you know their retention, you know, or the the real world tasks you want them to perform as a result of a serious game, for example, um, could be in serious jeopardy. Mm -hmm. so now the third thing I want to talk about was uh, augmented reality. And one of my favorite uh, examples of, of, you know, movie augmented reality that we saw early on uh, in movies was from Terminator 2. Um, mm -hmm. When he goes back, he's got, you know, this is what he sees out of his visor, but there's a lot of data that's coming up on the side. And this is what augmented reality really is. It's adding layers of data to the world around us as we view it. So we've got this view. He's in a bar. He sees this man who's playing pool. And... What he's looking for is he's looking for clothes to to wear to, to uh, as a disguise, and all of this, these assessments are going on in front of him and showing him exactly um, they're augmenting what he sees. So it tells him his the male the man's height and weight and uh, an assessment scan that's going on. Um, you could also see this as you know example for facial recognition or, or whatever things that the person can't do, but that the the software or machine on top can do, and adding that and then pr reporting that layer back to the person themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, so both the layer on top of the current reality. Um, a lot of times, this takes place as a projection over the site layer. So, for example, you might see uh, street line, street sign readers as you go into other countries. You can pull up an app that will, in real time, take characters that aren't familiar with you and translate them um, right on the sign itself rather than make, making you go to another visualization layer, you can see the world as if you, you know, if it were actually different. You, it projects something else. Some of the weirder augmented reality we see is, um, you know, you can actually, like, make a, um, something fly out of nothing. Um, probably not as useful. It's really cool. But um, another example of projection over a site layer is we see this in biology examples where, you can um, drill, let's say you have a, a skull in front of you, you can drill into multiple layers that show it. Um, it still has the skull in your real space, but you can see um, the different bone, you know, different layers. You could have the, the skin layer, you could have the muscle layer, you have different brain layers. As you get deeper into it, um, that allow you to, it allows you to see that without having to um, bring up anything different. Um, right. it, it can provide feedback that's not normally available through the senses. So. How hot is you know how hot is it outside? Um, as we saw, um, pulling in data that you just can't quite calculate. You can think, well, he kind of looks like that person. Well, let's try a facial match. He, you know, how how tall is that? How um, uh, you know different any sort of uh, other sort of conditions that our senses can't pick up that a computer could you know either calculate for us or. Um, or even even through time, I should say. Um, so I, that should be another example here. Is that um, what some of the examples I've seen with augmented reality is to show uh, different layers in time. So you could take a augmented reality and look at a, a building that used to be there. For example, you, we had a couple different um, people at the university that would design old, old world experiences where you would walk around a current town, but you could view it as a town in say the 1800s um, to, to see. Uh, to see that and to interact with it. Yeah. So how does Experience API work with uh, augmented reality? It can uh, populate based on that uh, the layer's information, um, not just, um, it, it, can, I mean, it can grab data from other systems and actually put that on. Um, so it can do that in real time. Mm -hmm. And it can report on the user's interaction with it. So once they have this layer, and maybe it's instant, maybe it's not, but how long, you know, how long after receiving this information does the user react? Um, how do they react differently when they're in the augmented reality versus just reality? 
And then uh, you can also tie in the, the meta of uh, authoring tools and performance support. So um, what, what I mean by this is that um, that when you uh, look at uh, how authoring tools and uh, performance support would impact your reality, um, mm -hmm. how does that, I'm trying to think of a good example. You mean when I'm fixing a machine? Right, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, exactly. That's that's the one that just came in, right. So if you're, if you're um, fixing a machine, how would, you know, how do you do what with you have that layer up? Um, in your performance, in, in your support, performance support, yeah. performance support. Um, <laughs> right. How, yeah, you know, how are you doing once that layer is up versus not? And in XAPI, it's really easy to do this through the context yeah. object. You simply mm -hmm. would uh, provide context whether that augmented reality layer is up or not. Right. So it's really augmented reality. Is the name really explain itself? And XAPI can easily enhance the augmented reality functionality. Right, right. Yeah, and also connect like connect our brain with a computer. Really empower a human. Yeah, uh, augmented reality is, is great for that and the, there's just so many applications of it to to make us essentially more powerful. I mean our tools try to do that and you know we've kind of seen a Google Glass for example it yeah. is kind of augmented reality. Um, it, it, it's kind of like a second reality in front of you more realistically, but the idea is to, to keep us in our own space and to, to make these two things be, become one. Uh, we yeah. really haven't seen this yet, but you know, it's, I think it's getting close. And then for XAPI to be able to, to grab feedback on that is, is really, really useful. Cool. I do want to talk about uh, some of the difference between simulations and what we've talked about here. And simulation is also a, a platform, like a game. But I did want to just talk about some of the differences here because simulations are something I see as kind of the low-hanging fruit for Experience API, um, mm -hmm. mostly because uh, there are already large-scale simulations built. We talk about some serious games, but there aren't huge serious games that have very specific learning objectives like sims simulations have. Um, some of the, the notable differences are you don't always get immediate feedback in a simulation, and it's mm -hmm. not, and it's almost never exaggerated. It tries to mimic the real world as much as possible. You might not know uh, how what's gone bad until much later in in the trial. Um, mm -hmm. It really lets the quote unquote bad things build up. So let's say you know we're in an airplane here. Let's say you forgot to refuel. You know, you're not going to find that out until you actually run out of fuel in the simulation. Um, a game would probably have an intervention and, you know, basically say, oh, you failed because you're never going to make it there on time. We're not going to make you waste the extra 15 minutes uh, of mm -hmm. doing everything else. We're just going to tell you you failed. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, if you, in a medical simulation, if you uh, are doing a procedure and you forget the sponge inside or something, um, it's probably not going to tell you until it, it actually probably will never tell you. What will probably tell you is the, uh, the person watching you is, after you've completed the surgery and the patient has, you know, quote, unquote, left. So, you get, yeah, here's where you messed up. But, you know, you're not going to see that um, hitting you in the face. Uh, simulations also don't encourage exploration and discovery. Uh, they want you to do something, a specific task, and they want you to do it well. A good game will let you explore um, this choice space and see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. Games are very conducive to failure in that way. The, the, well, are, they will encourage you to fail to understand that space better. Uh, a medical simulation it either won't let you, won't have the uh, fidelity, you know, the, the, the choices in it to fail in a certain way, or mm -hmm. it will, uh, or it'll let you go to the end. To, and, and fail that way, but it doesn't. It doesn't really encourage that type of thing um, yeah. uh, to, it, within it. But we do really appreciate that the, uh, the the feedback that a simulation can provide in terms of XAPI data, because like a game, it can be immediate. It can be very tied to events, 
but you know, it, in terms of motivating, it's oftentimes not going to be as good as a game because it just doesn't uh, have those those uh, those things going on. You might you, the other controls are there though. You might have a narrative. Um, you don't really win or lose a simulation. I guess you, you know either you do it well or you don't. So maybe simulation doesn't allow exploration is because um, if you do something wrong, you will have very serious results and induce a, a high cost from the result. Right, that's certainly part of it. I mean, yeah, they're not meant. It's not meant to be a, a teaching tool. It's meant to be oftentimes a tool to see if you can express what you've already learned. But you know, there there is value in uh, exploring failure spaces. So some of the lessons we've learned in what Experience API can do that are some really mm -hmm. neat things um, is that you can use X API to manage a state. So what I mean by this is. You can manage a state of something across different platforms or across different sessions. So one of the examples we've seen this in are uh, people who have ebooks and they want to make annotations in those ebooks, or they want to leave off in a certain space. Um, XAPI is really good at um, grabbing enough information to then reconstruct an entire environment. So even if you didn't save a file that has your annotations from an ebook in it or didn't um, mark your page with a bookmark or anything, if you leave, let's say, on your computer mm -hmm. that, that file, and then you come back to that file on your uh, smartphone or tablet, uh, if you're logged into, let's say, an Experience API system that can pull down that data, it can reconstruct the, all the progress you've done to date. It doesn't matter if you're authenticated to that uh, to whatever application you were originally viewing it on. doesn't matter if you saved the file. Uh, the fact that you've done it, can, XAPI can rebuild state from all of the different statements you've created. Um, it doesn't matter where you go. Essentially, all, all of your data is in the cloud, and environments can reconstruct that data. Uh, we've learned how people design. XAPI can integrate directly into authoring tools, which really gets into some of the meta of how people do things. So, for example, we had uh, somebody who integrated their uh, XAPI into their um, tool that allowed you to do a graphic design or graphical engineering. We could look at then how people actually went through the process of engineering because ev on every button of the tool, we had an XAPI statement sent out that said, the author is doing this. The author is, you know, combining these colors. The author is sliding a bar to, to change the color. The author is, create, is uh, creating a curvature uh, line this way. So seeing how people design can be useful. Um, looking at you know which tools have product features that are desirable, which how are people misusing tools? Maybe somebody in the organization is extremely successful at the tool. Well, how are they using it that other people aren't? Um, how, maybe we can teach them. Maybe we can make UI improvements to make the more effective tools uh, up front and kind of put move some of the other to the background. Mm -hmm. um, being able to grab uh, stats, um, multi-user and specific concepts can make for some really cool leaderboards. Um, just being able to grab this stuff really easily um, from an application, for example, that might be super simple. So you could have a very simple game, which and, and I'm going to give you an example of that next, that it's a super simple game, but you can really make some cool um, things happen just because of the fact that it, one is one social and two is shared information. And the other one is this notion of distributed processing. And again, going back to simpler games, um, the idea that you might not necessarily have to do all the processing to create a leaderboard within the game itself, that some other system can grab all that experience API data, make a visualization you know, by mm -hmm. crunching all that data on a different server and then sending that back down it is going to be easier um, than uh, having the application itself do all that processing. Um, and that way you can make, you know, apps mm -hmm. more lightweight, that it just has to ask, ask the, for the data visualization rather than creating it itself. So ADL has uh, this virtual world sandbox game. So ADL has this 
first of all, let me explain the virtual world sandbox. It, it's basically this uh, free to access um, library and um, environment where you can um, grab 3D objects that have already been created by others, create your own 3D objects, and then put them in a real world that runs. Um, so I'm going to just show this screen for a little bit, but then the next screen I want to show you are the controls. So, oops, I'm sorry. Actually, okay, let, well, let's skip back and forth. I have these in the wrong order. So um, to get to that authoring example, on the bottom here we see a play, a pause, and a, a stop button. Um, so you've got those real controls. Uh, you can see at the bottom too. That there's, there's, we're actually looking at a scene. Um, so you put, you basically author a scene, and then you can hit play to have it go. Um, that doesn't mean you can't um, do other stuff in real time. The maze itself. Which, um, um, so this game that we created is a maze. So you, everybody who plays it, um, you can either author your own maze or load a maze. Uh, the the maze itself is pre-built. Uh, so you don't have to go through all that. You could change things up if you wanted. But the interesting thing in this maze are the obstacles. So you can see the, the little discs um, are uh, are different uh, um, bouncers that go back and forth and try to get you. There are walls that open and shut. The, the blue guy down here um, is actually a flamethrower. So if you walk into that line of sight, um, the fire comes out. Um, there's lasers. There's um, a ball that chases you around. There's different different traps, basically, um, that this maze has um, that you can author. Now, this is, is somewhat interesting. You can design a fun maze and then take it. But where it really starts getting interesting is when you start tracking, um, and uh, tracking across people. So you can design your own maze. Then you can look for different cool things on, on you know, how many times did you – how many times did it take you to get to the end? How many different obstacles could you avoid? How long did it take you? Um, and then you can challenge your friends to play the same maze and see how they do. Um, in, the, in that way, a very simple construct becomes much more interesting because now you've made it social. Similarly, you can also grab, you know, okay, out of all of the traps that are set, which ones, you know, kill the guy in the maze the most? Which ones are the most effective? Which are more effective if combined with other things? You know, being able to pull up those types of stats um, can make it really interesting. Maybe you then create challenges out of that. Okay, can you make a maze that uh, can get a high amount of people even with the worst trap? Um, can you make, you know, what's the fastest you can get through um, a maze with 30 traps? You, know, you can make some really interesting um, data um, challenges and visualizations out of this. Um, also combining that with the authoring, when we author in this environment, XAPI statements also go out. So we can see which players are using which traps and are designing different things in this world. Um, we can see that, uh, for example, uh, you know, which trap do people grab first? Which is the most interesting? Which are not used? Which is least interesting? Uh, if we, we, and we don't have this, but if we were to uh, put an economy on it, for example. Let's say you had $10,000 to spend on traps and every trap had a certain uh, cost. Um, which do people go for? How, what kind of strategies do people take in, in, as they author? Mm -hmm. oh, you know, this is an example that was pretty easy for us to do because we already had this virtual world up. Um, just to inject some XAPI and really make some interesting things happen, um, to make some fun things happen. We, You know, we made essentially a game out of nothing. Um, I shouldn't say nothing, but, you know, a game out of something that was already in place, and then it, we're able to put XAPI into it right away. So the virtual sandbox tool is open source. Some idea. Um, I, I don't get, it's, it's open source. It's open source in that anybody can use it. I don't know if the software, anybody can use it. I don't know if anybody can grab the source and edit it, though. That's what I, I actually have a question into our guy who runs it, um, if, if that type of interaction is available. And I'll have that for you, Jesse, by the time this goes live. Uh, the okay. other part, and I'm hoping to get you, I'll get you some access instructions as well. Um, can we embed web content into the virtual world? You can have links. Um, so, 
So like you can, we, what I've seen them do is they can, you can uh, say if they click this object in the virtual world that uh, a window pops open with a browser for a resource, for example. So they designed a virtual garden once where you could uh, click the information and it um, could go out to the web. There was, they, I think they have also designed parts of it that it could, as long as the text was plain, they could pull it in. Um, I think they can do either of those things. I see. So, you, well, so let's say you want it to look nice in a graphical layer and you just want it to be a pop-up overlay. I believe that's possible. Uh, I know they did an application that did it. I don't know if that's a if that's something that's on the base mod or not, or if that was just a part of that game. But I know you can interact with it and have it send you out to an actual uh, URL. Yeah, so the sandbox is already implemented with SAPI. And so anyone can use the sandbox to create a virtual world game to learn something. Yep. Cool. Okay, Um. so um, from Andy's talk, oh, we know that not only SAP can be integrated into games, but also we can learn from game design. Um, what why I'm saying this because uh, when like Andy says, uh, game blocks is actually like SAP statement, and it's a natural thing. And also very important, uh, Andy had mentioned many times that the immediate feedback from games inside of games. Is what makes the game effective and to help learners learn. And what SAP add on to this capability is SAP can manage states across different systems, statements from different platforms. So if you think of SAP statements as game logs, and we can uh, leverage all these SAP statement data layers to uh, build gamification and social layers and to build, build meaningful feedback to learners when they uh, do uh, learning distributed across different platforms. That's my takeaways for, from today's talk. So, um, Nancy, I really like your uh, images in this presentation. Maybe I should ask, um, how do you choose the images to um, to deliver your messages? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I do a lot of Google searches, and then I have to, uh, you know, make sure I have their, that they're licensed correctly. So if anybody needs those, they can, uh, I can tell you how I've got them and who they're from. But uh, yeah, I like, I, I like to make, uh, I like to make it fun. So hopefully it was. And uh, thanks very much for having me, Jesse. Yeah, really a good talk. Thank you.